So I think it's appropriate to begin with a Valentine, and that's exactly what you're looking at. This is a, an image uh, made in 1954, the year that Jasper Johns and Dr. Rajmur met and became partners, and Rajmur gave him this on Valentine's Day. Um, it's uh, one of the early uh, red paintings, and we'll talk about them in, in just a minute. But I first want to give you um, a sense of the figures in question. This is them at that, in that same year, 1954. Um, uh, their relationship was well known within the New York art world. Uh, in fact, uh, later, Rauschenberg was asked about it, and he said, well, it was kind of new to the, new, to the art world that the two up-and-coming studs were romantically involved, end quote. Um, and for his part, uh, John's created much more, as you'll see, much more encoded and complicated to decipher works that dealt with sexuality. This is his Tennyson. And if you look carefully, you'll see that it has the aspect of a gravestone, right? And um, as if um, one is looking at a grave. And that immediately caused me to think about a poem um, by Tennyson called In Memoriam. And we know that Johns and Rauschenberg uh, were both very interested in poetry. In fact, uh, Rauschenberg was dyslexic, so Johns would read him poetry at night in bed before they went to sleep. That was their ritual. And, and here we have uh, a bit of Tennyson's In Memoriam. And if along with these should come the man I held as half divine, should strike a sudden hand in mine, and ask a thousand things of home, and I should tell him all my pain and how my life had drooped of late, and he should sorrow o'er my state and marvel what possessed my brain. So word by word and line by line, the dead man touched me from the past. And all at once, it seemed at last, the living soul was flashed on mine. And mine in this was wound and whirled about imperial heights of thought and came on that which is and caught the deep pulsations of the world. So John sees in this poem some measure, right, that speaks to his relationship with Rauschenberg. But I'm really getting ahead of the story because I want to actually first get um, in front of you works by Rauschenberg from before he meets Jasper Johns. And um, this is one of them. So uh, Rauschenberg got an, an invite to a uh, show at the Stable Gallery, one of the great avant-garde galleries in New York. And this is the literal show from before Rauschenberg's show. Um, it's actually by the artist Barnett Newman. And um, he saw it, and he destroyed everything that he had planned to show. And in a sort of fit of creativity, over uh, the course of a month, made a whole series of new works, all of which, I want to argue, comment not so obliquely on what he had just seen, right? Um, so he's obviously excavating the sort of phallicism of Barnett Newman's work. And similarly, he takes, for example, Jackson Pollock, um, then, of course, one of the key figures in the American art world, and he does this work, Mother of God, um, which actually uses collaged Washington, D.C. roadmaps from a Rand McNally atlas that he's pasted in, um, drawn a big circle in the middle. And there's a quotation in the bottom right, and it reads, a spiritual roadmap as simple and fundamental as life itself. Obviously, a kind of play on the vaunted and highfalutin language of abstract expressionism. And um, of course, by definition, these squiggles cannot be indices of emotion or subjectivity because they're mass manufactured things, right? And I think he's suggesting that much of the emotion in abstract expressionism is similarly mass manufactured. In fact, he seems, as an early artist, to be dedicated against the idea of traditional notions of expressivity. This is his automobile tire print. Uh, he glued um, 188 pages together, and he drove a car across it, um, creating this uh, image. And that's the car. Um, and in a famous uh, comment about it, he says, quote, everybody knows that I did automobile tire print, 
but which one of us drove the car? Because this is an image of John Cage, and it was John Cage's car. So he's basically saying, I'm not expressing anything. You don't even know which one of us did this thing. And that lack of expression reaches its zenith here in the white paintings, which he decreed when they yellow should be painted by others using house paint and a roller. They've been repeatedly re-whitened because he said there is no self in them. Cage famously called them airports for light and shadow. And what's remarkable about these works, which, by the way, antedated John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, in the score for four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, Cage says, everyone, you should know Rauschenberg's white paintings came first. So, um, and by uh, several years, in fact. But this is a time when Rauschenberg is having great emotional trauma. Uh, in a letter to his dealer, he says, there's nothing of me in these. Um, and he's having, in part, emotional trauma because he had been married earlier to a woman named Susan Weil, and she had just given birth to a son, Christopher. And he had returned to Black Mountain College where he fell in love with um, um, an artist who is probably the third great American artist of this era, Cy Twombly. And it was an affair that everybody knew about, talked about. We have exchanges of letters from Black Mountain College that make it very clear that this was sort of everybody's uh, knowledge at Black Mountain. It was a small place, Black Mountain. And Rauschenberg um, had his wife, Susan, come down. She immediately found out about the relationship with Twombly. Heartbroken, she left with Christopher. And Rauschenberg did something that we know about, again, from the exchange of letters, um, that was quite extreme. He tried to kill himself uh, in the lake at Black Mountain College on a January night. Around midnight, he jumped into the water and tried to drown himself. Um, Cy Twombly arranged for a number of people to use flashlights. Black Mountain didn't have any outdoor lighting, so everybody had to go back to their cabins in flashlights and had them all train their flashlights on Rauschenberg in the middle of the lake. And as they did that, Twombly went out into that freezing lake in the January night and talked him in. And for those of you who've wondered where Johns's flashlight comes from, um, that's where it comes from. Um, but this is an artist, I hope it's clear by now, of absences, silences, negations in this period before he meets Jasper Johns. This is his erased de Kooning drawing in which <clears throat> he went to de Kooning and he said, I'd like to have a drawing um, which I intend to erase and call my own. It is the act of erasure that will make it mine. And de Kooning understanding the artistic value of the statement, but not terribly pleased, spent quite a long time rifling through his drawers until he found a drawing that had seven different media in it. And then um, Rauschenberg had to erase that. It took him over three weeks and numerous different kinds of erasers in order to do it. He wasn't going to make it easy. In fact, many years later, Rauschenberg makes fun of abstract expressionism even more explicitly in factum one, factum two, almost like a legal case, right? The language of factum. What he's doing is he's showing us the signs of an abstract expressionist gestural emotion, but then he's repeating them in the next canvas, saying that there is nothing authentic about emotion here. It's merely a performance. And then, quite remarkably, he slips. And this is the slip. This is his Should Love Come First from 1951, made exactly the year that his wife leaves and they begin a divorce. So Should Love Come First really addresses the relationship between responsibility, he is after all a new father, and love, the love he has for Cy Twombly. And it's a very complicated painting because what it consists of is a series of uh, quotations, of course, from a magazine, Should Love Come First, then his own footprint adjoining a waltz diagram from the Arthur Murray Studios male position, so a male, male waltz. Then here, a timetable indicating 
uh, in the predecessor to Amtrak, what the various schedules were from Washington, D.C. So it's about essentially how to understand time from a central point. It's kind of an analog for the idea that there's a defining center and then a series of variations. But the most striking thing about it is everywhere the doubling of like with like. Eight being, of course, the most perfect emblem of that because its two sides look alike. But everywhere, you will see numbers doubled, same with same. And for Rauschenberg, this idea, of course, bespeaks right, his coming to terms with his sexuality. And yet, he gets very nervous after he makes this painting, in part because he had just met John Cage. John Cage, actually, this was the occasion of their meeting. Cage loved this painting. And he said to the dealer, I'd like to have it, but I have no money. And the dealer said, well, you'll have to talk to Rauschenberg then. So he goes over and talks to Rauschenberg. And it's an immediate meeting of the minds. They become so close that eventually Cage um, gives Rauschenberg the key to his apartment. And Rauschenberg, in turn, gives him Should Love Come First. And it, Should Love Come First stays this way for about a year until one day Rauschenberg lets him in and completely overpaints the painting in black. And he overpaints it in black because I think it was a little bit too close, a little too emotionally fraught to be allowed to live. Note that footprint in Should Love Come First because it becomes something of a theme in Rauschenberg's work in part as a kind of ironic implication of the famous abstract expressionist notion of the hand, of the touch, right? And Rauschenberg does exactly the obverse, the foot, the stamp. But Johns, in a work called Tango, made very shortly after they uh, met, gives us what um, is actually a music box buried into the surface right here. There's the key. Um, uh, he broke it so it can't play anything. But of course, it is, I think, a reference to the earlier Should Love Come First and the notion of male, male waltz that that picture contained. And in fact, Johns picks up the theme of the foot. You see the, the footprint here in the drawing? Or here in Edisto? a kind of continuous reference in Johns's work to the foot. And indeed, here, with a typically Rauschenbergian pun, souls, um, Johns buys the work and keeps it. It's still in his collection today. When Johns and Rauschenberg meet, this is a series of photos by uh, Rauschenberg of Johns from uh, Johns working in the studio. Um, the effect is palpable. Friends said they finished each other's, other's sentences, they seemed more one person than two. And all of a sudden, the artist of white paintings, absence, negation, silence, becomes an abstract expressionist. The drips and squiggles, the signs of emotion that had been so rigorously right, paired from his work now come pouring back. And not only do they come pouring back, but this is a work that actually references a Jasper Johns painting being completed one floor below because they moved into the same building. And um, Johns is working on his famous flag painting. And as you look, you can see that this is divided into two canvases. And if you take the lower part of the canvas, you'll see that there's an area of collage and scumbled paint exactly where the field of the stars on an American flag would be. And Rauschenberg buries in that a comic strip that reads, five foot 10, hair sandy, eyes blue, my dear, you're not as guilty as you think, end quote. And it is a description physically accurate and emotionally accurate of Jasper Johns at the time, because he was just beginning that relationship and um, unclear as to whether he really wanted to be in a gay relationship. Rauschenberg seals the deal because in 1954 he makes this work. Sorry for the crappy slide. This is never reproduced, so I, I got this out of a museum show in a very bad early camera. Um, 
But what you're seeing is a plastic pocket. You see it on the upper right. And it contains a series of hearts cut out of a deck of cards. So there's just all the hearts in a deck of cards in that pocket as a kind of Valentine, again, 1954, for Jasper Johns on Valentine's Day. Rauschenberg then completes Minutia. And uh, this was done for the Merce Cunningham Dance Theater. John Cage's partner, Merce Cunningham, had a dance theater. Rauschenberg was hired to be the uh, set director and costume designer. And he creates this work, which is uh, used initially in Italy. And it's filled with all sorts of collage comic strips, all sorts of things that the title tells us have a certain kind of weird import. Because, of course, what is minutia but little things, right? And so I decided one day to go up close and look at this thing. And what I found is that it is absolutely larded with various comic strips that once again speak to his relationship with John's, including my favorite one, which is two men huddling underneath the stage. And they're talking to one another. And one of them says in the, thought, in the speech balloon, hey, do you think they're going to see us hiding under here? And the other one says, oh, no, dear. They're all be looking at the zebra on the stage. And that's what we've been doing with Rauschenberg and John. We've been looking at the zebra on the stage, and that's by design. So this is it with Merce Cunningham in front of it in its original form. So this is Short Circuit. And Short Circuit um, came about out of a kind of failed promise. What happened is that Rauschenberg promised his friends, Jasper Johns and uh, Susie uh, Gablick and several other figures, that he would get them into the stable annual, an exhibition at the stable gallery, because what, when you showed at the stable gallery, the idea was that the next year you could invite two friends to show as well, and that's how they'd grow the uh, gallery's collection. Unfortunately, in 1955, after he'd sent out the invitation, the stable said, oop, we've gotten too big. We're going to cut that. And so Rauschenberg had a problem. He'd made a promise, and now he couldn't keep it. So what does he do? He submits the lower work, and then he opens it at the top. And that is the first Jasper Johns on exhibition in any public museum. That's the flag painting. And other artists that he promised, including Ray Johnson, are also in this work. So he smuggles them all in, in his work. Now, this is, of course, that famous flag. It would eventually be on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, without a doubt, one of the most important works in the American canon. And what's interesting about it is that in 1954, no one knew quite what to make of it. The United States was just out of McCarthyism. So it's a period in which the American flag and all it stands for is of great significance. And yet, when the Museum of Modern Art wanted to buy this work, the board balked and said, we can't buy this. It's too controversial. And the minutes of the meeting are very strange because they say, well, what's controversial about American flag? But of course, what's controversial is that no one can understand exactly what Johns means. What's the intent behind this work? Especially given the fact that it raises a very Johnsian question. That question is, what is an American flag? A series of stars and stripes in requisite color order on canvas. The very conditions that this work meets, right? It is all those things. And so is it a flag or is it a painting of a flag? Its identity is, of course, up in the air. And in part, Johns wants to suggest that identities are not naturally given, but socially constructed. And as a queer artist, he's very much interested in making the claim that everything that everybody thinks they know is, in fact, merely a kind of common agreement, a kind of social agreement as to what this means. Because if I were to, to find a population that had never lived in the contemporary world and I'd shown them this, they'd have no idea what I was referencing, even though I could show them a tree, and though we would have different language, they would know exactly what it was. Then Johns begins to really explode this idea. So here is flag above white. Um, and um, notice something interesting. Notice how when he puts the flag on a white field, 
our eye gets confused. We don't know whether to read this as a flag on top of a white field or whether, in fact, the white is actually undergirding the entire image. And what we're seeing is just red stripes on a white field. And then he gives it to us in white, asking, OK, what are the minimal conditions of flagness? If we're socially constructing meaning here, what are the terms? What are the limits of that meaning? And then he finally gives us three flags. And this posed a really interesting question that I've always wanted an answer to, which is this is made in and cost an extremely time consuming and difficult medium of beeswax and pigment that has to be heated to the exact right temperature and is an extraordinarily difficult medium to work with. John's here poses the question to people like me, did he paint underneath the part that you couldn't see, right? And I always wanted to know that. And finally, this was conserved. And when they conserved it, they had to take it apart. And sure enough, John's painted underneath it. And of course, John's painted underneath it because he's raising the problem of what happens to a flag if it's three flags, not if it's one flag and two flag borders, but three flags. And with the kind of rigorous philosophical mind of John's, it had to be right, three flags. Then he even asks us what happens to a flag if you put it on an orange field. How is that different than the other works? And then he even further does a kind of complicated game here, because why is he doing it in these weird colors of orange, black, and green? Well, they're the color, were, color wheel obverse of red, white, and blue. So if you stare at that, and then you look at a white page, your eyes will reverse and you'll see the flag in red, white, and blue. Johns wants to make clear, once again, that meaning is not something that he owns, like abstract expressionism would claim, but something that we own. Weirdly, Johns then begins a series of images of encaustic covered texts. In this instance, book from 1957, newspaper from 1957, and then he expands it to include, for example, drawer from 1957, all these things that only function open. And he's giving them to us literally painted shut, covered in thick gray and caustic. It's as if, and this is, I think, an important distinction, this is not silence, because silence is something you don't notice. It's a silencing. It's a performance of silence. It's telling us he's not telling us. He's even doing a work like canvas here, which has the format of a portrait, but with one canvas turned away from right the viewer so that you can't see anything. And he even further thematizes it in Disappearance 2, which consists of two canvases, both heavily overpainted, and one canvas has been folded over. Do you see that? So that it tells us what we can see, as the title does as well. So in every instance, Johns is saying, there's things I cannot say. Although he does find very small ways to say them. This is his map. And it's a very minor point. But that's Port Arthur, Texas. And that's a heart, another Valentine's Day gift. <coughs> Uh, Rauschenberg is from Port Arthur, Texas. I should make that clear. Um, now, Rauschenberg in 1954-55 begins to work in what would come to be called the combines, uh, this transformative medium that's neither painting nor sculpture. And this is a collection. And it contains, among all of its comic strip elements, um, one particular comic strip, uh, uh, a comic strip called Moon Mullins, which talks about boys going to the uh, pool to show off to pretty girls, a very 50s comic strip. And, um, and then we see that Moon goes up to the tallest diving board, and he dives off of it. But then, weirdly, Rauschenberg cuts that frame. So we don't know what happens. But in the next work, Charlene, he completes it. In fact, he had to buy four copies of the newspaper in order to do all the references to Moon Mullins here. So something had to be important. And indeed, in Charlene, 
we get the final piece, which is that he dies off the diving board, and he immediately hits his chin on the diving board, and he yells, Ali. And then the next frame, as he's falling down into the water, he yells, oop. And that's where it is, but you'll never see it. It's just impossible for me to give you this. Now, why is he giving this idea of a diver failing? Well, we know from Rachel Rosenthal, who uh, inhabited the apartment that Jasper Johns ultimately took, that um, Johns was uh, absolutely, she thought, beautiful. She was very much in love with him. Um, but he was, in the early days of their relationship, unsure of whether he was interested in men or men and women. And so he had some affairs with women but he proved, let's say, weak in the follow through. Um, and so it becomes a way of talking about his failures in bed to sort of talk about him hitting his head on the diving board while showing off to pretty girls, right? Um, and then Johns clearly knows this because the next image he does is Ali Oop from 1958 in which he, um, uh, in thick, blocky strokes, gives us the outlines of a comic. Now, Rauschenberg, in 1954, uh, completing this in 1958, does two works that I think of as pendants. They belong together. Um, they both contain that weird balustrade, um, an identical balustrade um, that holds it up. Originally, um, and, and they're called on the left, Man with the White Shoes, Untitled, and on the right, uh, Otelisk. Otelisk being, of course, a very Rauschenbergian coinage because it combines two words, the female archetype of the reclining nude, an odalisk, and an obelisk, of course, that classically phallic uh, architectural form. And originally, Rauschenberg wanted Otelisk, which is what I'm showing you here, to uh, go between the bride and a groom on a cardboard model of a wedding cake that he bought out of a Warworth window. But he kept trying to get it to work in his studio and it kept falling over. So he eventually said, screw that. And instead he soaked a pillow in plaster so it would be rigid and then stuck it through there. But this is a remarkable work because what I want to argue is that Otelisk and Untitled with the Man with the White Shoes are actually his gay and straight works. And this is his straight work. It is topped by a cock. It has images of nude women um, taken from various nudie magazines, a wolf doing a wolf whistle, right? Um, it even has up here um, from a Boy Scout manual um, how to throw a punch. It says correct fist, incorrect fist. So all the sort of performative masculinity that he identifies as heteronormative is there, along with lots of other images, including uh, Cupid and, and uh, Venus. What's striking about it is that it's, of course, hollow on, uh, on the inside. And then we have the gay image Man with the White Shoes. This is not Cy Twombly, but it looks like Cy Twombly. So he's playing, I think, with that. He's also, of course, giving a reflection. So he's playing with the homophobic construct of narcissism and homosexuality. And then instead of a cock, he gives us a hen, right? Uh, very clearly a female bird. And then what he does on the surface is absolutely remarkable. Only people in the front row are going to be able to see that that is an American flag. So he's immediately referencing Jasper Johns. But more than that, he's emptied out his clip books of great things of great personal value. This contains the newspaper notification that his sister had won the Louisiana Yam Queen competition. Um, in 1928, his mother and father got married. It has a photo of their wedding and another photo of his mother at the beach that year. So all of these emblems of family love, but it also has love letters from Jasper Johns. It has inscriptions from Cy Twombly. And it's telling essentially that love is love. Family love, gay love, same thing. And indeed, um, if you look closely here, 
you'll see that's um, an image he cut out from um, some source of a 19th century couple of women who are kissing. Do you see what I'm pointing out there? Um, along with an image of his son, Christopher, up there. This is a work by Cy Twombly. Um, and that in the middle is the image of his mother at the beach from 1928. He's starting to get freer with his subcultural references, increasingly sure that he's never going to be caught. In fact, in 1961, he gives a talk at the Museum of Modern Art, and he says the following. Being a great artist is like committing the perfect crime. And the interviewer says, what? Why? And he says, you never get caught. And I think he kind of thought he'd never get caught. So what does he do in Bantam? But give us an image that is dependent on the very idea of, right, a kind of the, the smallest category of boxer. That, that boxer who is the lowest weight category, right, who is sort of performatively violent but just can't quite pull it off. And then Bantam, moreover, contains an image, I think a kind of uh, parody of abstract expressionism, of uh, a woman looking at herself in the mirror, the, the Rokeby Venus, here um, as if like staring at one's own reflection, along with quite literally a silk screen. This is a piece of silk on a photograph, and that photograph is none other than Judy Garland, right? So uh, already an icon for gay men. By 1959, in a work like Kickback, sexuality is coming to the fore. Just read the surface. If you look carefully, it says king, and then what you want there, and those are Jasper Johns's pants. And if you look carefully out of the pants above a scumbled pubic black form is a white tie coming down, um, making a play on what friends of John's would remark, which is, shall we just say, that he was talented in ways beyond the pictorial. Um, and, um, and then, if you look carefully, it's very hard to see. You're going to have to take my word for it. There's a series of Life magazine photographs of the very first nuclear submarine breaking the ice, the first icebreaker. And there it is, and there it is. And so the picture shows the submarine coming up as if right into the public. You don't even need me to interpret this, but it's never been noted before. Read the surface. Right? Your ass. Um, and yet, what we see at this moment of increasing explicitness in Rauschenberg is actually moments of great stress with Johns. What had once been so perfect begins to come undone. And in 1961, they break up. And this is the breakup picture. Um, it's a picture that shows us something very curious. If you look carefully, you'll see that it is the pictorial obverse of the picture associated with their coming together, the pictorial obverse of the flag. It's as it were a flag as a negative, right? And then it's divided into two parts with these, um, these uh, hinges that hold it together. And on one side, you see a fork and a spoon tied together. We use the term spooning to suggest being together. And on the other side, there's the fork and the spoon separated. They're hard to see, but they are there. And it becomes a way of talking about the end of the relationship to separate that fork and the spoon. And indeed, Johns um, repeatedly would reference that, as I'll show you later, um, as an emblem of his relationship, uh, marked weirdly through cutlery. Um, and um, on the separation side, where the fork and spoon are separated, we also recently x-rayed the painting, and there's a skull and crossbones underneath the paint and the words dead man. So clearly, there's something very profound going on. Rauschenberg, in his turn, does a breakup work. It's this one and the next. Um, this is Rauschenberg's illustrations from the Dante drawings. Um, the Dante drawings, of course, were illustrations of Dante's famous Inferno, that great medieval text which talks about 
all the levels of hell that people had to inhabit and the punishments therein. Dante, of course, made it as a way of making uh, fun of all the people he felt betrayed him. And in Canto number 14, he talks about one Ser Brunetto Latini, his teacher, who was, in the language of the poem, a sodomite. And the punishment was to run barefoot over hell's hot sands. And so what does Rauschenberg do? He traces his own foot, there's that foot again, in red, a kind of hot foot, right? Um, but not only does he give it his foot, but he also gives us footprints leading down to this red and white stripes, which suggests the edge of an American flag, right? So he's bringing Johns into this as well. And if you look carefully, you'll see the foot is above a figure. That's a diver taken from Sports Illustrated magazine. So the whole diver theme seems to come back as well, and we'll explore why. The Dante drawings have never been read in terms of the relationship to Johns and Rauschenberg, but they beg for it. This is canto number 34, the canto that is the pit of hell, the very mouth of hell. Dante tells it it's reserved for those who've done the worst of all crimes, which interestingly enough is not murder, but betrayal of friendship. And of course, Dante uh, felt he had been betrayed by his friends. It's also notably an image of Jasper Johns. Because if you look very carefully, the entire image coheres into the shape of a gigantic phallus. It's not been noted, and in fact, when I first brought this up to the woman who wrote a book on this, um, I said, you know, why didn't you talk about the phallus? And she was like, what phallus? <laughs> um, but you see what I mean. And um, if you don't, then I will show you this drawing, which Johns did of his phallus, um, in which he uh, spread uh, uh, mineral oil on his genitals and then uh, touched it to the paper and then dusted the paper with graphite to make the image that you see here. Um, but Johns doesn't like being blamed for the end of the relationship because in fact, Rauschenberg breaks up the couple through an affair with a dancer in Merce Cunningham's company by the name of Steve Paxson. So Johns feels that Rauschenberg broke it off first. And so Johns produces a series of works that are notable for the fury. Um, the, um, the recent Johns retrospective had all of these works in a room that said the mood has changed, but never told you why the mood has changed. Well, this is why the mood has changed. And so you see no here, right, with the word no. Then you see no here with this seeming scraping down of kind of cleaning of the slate and starting all over again. You see another no and then good time Charlie. Um, and again, that kind of device that seems to be, right, wiping the slate clean. Um, even here, cut, tear, scrape, erase. All of these terms of negation of fury, right, in the work. But notably, Johns is never so simple-minded as to be purely expressive. So each of the um, sections of cut, tear, scrape, erase also show us a cut, a tear, a scrape, and erase. Liar, right? And in a letter, Rauschenberg says, I know liar is about me. Um, but Johns, again, never being simply self-expressive, also makes liar lie about itself because it looks like it's imprinted with a hinge, right, so that it prints the word liar, but that's all trumploy. It doesn't do that, so it lies about itself. And then the diver returns. This is one of the most beautiful drawings, I think, in the history of art. Um, diver from 1963. It's eight feet tall. It's an enormous image. And as you can see, it sort of suggests, right, somebody doing a dive, moving their hands together as they're about to take a, a dive off the board. But the question becomes sort of, why does he bring back Diver? And he big, brings it back big. Work after work called Diver, immediately after the end of the relationship. And then 
in Land's End, you see this hand as if right, sinking below the surface of the water. And this is why. Because he's beginning to think about a poem um, called Periscope, Hart Crane, uh, Periscope by Hart Crane, the great mid-century American poet, who notably um, was forced into a marriage that he didn't want by his very wealthy family, and on returning from a honeymoon in Mexico, uh, had the ill fortune of uh, getting involved with a sailor on the ship, and that sailor rolled him, using the language of the time, beat him up and stole his money, and he couldn't lie about that. His wife was on, the, his new wife was on the ship, so he jumped off the ship and he killed himself at the age of 33. And for John's, Periscope is about how to survive the end of a love affair. Relapsing into silence while time clears, our lenses lifts a focus, resurrects a periscope to glimpse what joys or pain our eyes can share or answer, then deflects us, shunting to a labyrinth submersed where each sees only his dim past reversed. Now, it's a complicated poem, but think about a periscope. What does a periscope do? It reverses, right, what you're seeing. And what, in essence, Hart Crane is wanting to say here is that at the end of a love affair, you reverse everything you once thought. So whereas once that person was perfect and had no faults, now you can only think of their faults, right, and can't understand why you were involved with them in the first place. You go into the labyrinth and you erect a periscope. That's how you survive the end of a love affair. And so Johns is thinking about that, and thus the diver becomes, right, almost a kind of dive into the water, a suicidal dive, a heart crane dive. But then, right, in Periscope Heart Crane, he announces that he's coming back to the surface. One last quick thing. So some of you may remember a few years ago, Robert Rauschenberg uh, was featured in an exhibition at the PMA um, called Dancing Around the B Bride. And boy, did they dance around the bride because this was an exhibition supposedly on the relationships between Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, John Cage, Merce Cunningham, and their collective relationship to Marcel Duchamp. But no sexuality was ever mentioned. And the fact that the two partners were, in fact, partners was never mentioned. And so the bride was indeed danced around. And, um, and yet, this is the bride from 1959. And it tells us something very interesting. Indeed, it tells us where that memorial image um, uh, in memory of my feelings that I showed you earlier, the sort of reverse of the flag, came from. Because if you look carefully, there's a kind of bridal veil with a fork on it. And Jones' response is a spoon. Now, both of them are playing with Marcel Duchamp's famous door knocker on his Paris apartment, where she glued a spoon because it was easier to um, open. And of course, typically, uh, Duchamp, to open a door is to close a door, um, which is something that clearly John's feels is very resonant at this moment in his life. So in According to What, the largest painting he makes up till this time, and in fact the most Rauschenbergian in terms of its materials, John's gives us a spoon. Do you see it? Erected on that um, coat hanger. And then out the window, and there's the spoon and out the window, and all of a sudden, right, we see, once again, these repeated themes in the work as they talk back to each other. And of course, they're referencing this work. And then in 1964, Johns does one of the most moving works. It's called Voice. And if you look carefully, there's the fork and the spoon, right, now separated, and they act as a counterweight. And what are they doing? They're wiping the canvas clean. And if you look very closely, what's being wiped away is the word voice. So Johns is expressing his real concern that absent the one person who understood what he was getting at, to whom he could encode his meanings, right? There is no voice. And then he turns it into drawings and into prints. And then when 
um, the poet Frank O'Hara is tragically killed in, a, uh, in an accident on the beach. He was run over by a dune buggy. Um, Johns, who loved Frank O'Hara, then resurrects this work and um, O'Hara's own poem, In Memory of My Feelings, again in 1967. Even very late, this is 1982, look at the frame. You'll see that it's all made out of cutlery. So many years ago, I was contacted by a dealer in New York who was reframing this work, which is called Painting of Two Flags, or so we thought. But the dealer called me very excited, having read some of my stuff, and said, Jonathan, you have to get here. And I went there, again, sorry for the primitive camera. And that's what it reads. Study for two facts. Um, John's doesn't make mistakes like that. And of course, what's 1969 but the year of the Stonewall riots? So John's is doing his very small bit right for queer liberation. In 1983, he does this work, Ventriloquist. And it tells us something about his relationship to his sexuality, which was very different than Rauschenberg's. If you look very closely, you'll see that there is the outline in this work of a very particular image. I'm going to trace it with my hand. Those are the tail flukes. The body is largely off the canvas. That's the gigantic mouth and head with uh, big teeth on it. It is, in fact, the frontispiece from the greatest gay novel in American literature. Anybody? Melville's Moby Dick. Um, and indeed, right, uh, chapter 28, Men's hands grasping hands in an orgy of sperm. That's a quote from the novel. They're talking about butchering the whale and removing the spermaceti, but of course, Melville knows what he means. Um, so remember in the novel, Captain Ahab and Moby Dick are in a kind of bond together, but it's built on hate. And he's trying to kill the whale, the whale's trying to kill him. The whale seems to know what he thinks. He seems to know what the whale thinks, right? It's a very intense hate brothership. And ventriloquist is, of course, somebody who throws their voice through objects. And so what Johns is telling us is that in all of his work, he's been a kind of ventriloquist. He's been throwing his voice through objects, in this instance, through the frontispiece of the great gay novel Moby Dick. And he's not just giving us right, the, the sperm whale of Moby Dick, but that's a Barnett Newman painting called Voice on the upper right-hand corner. Of course, these are his famous flag paintings, including the one where you supply the red, white, and blue. So he's telling us that we're the maker. And, and even here, he's giving us a portrait vase um, that shows us Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, as well as a vase. Look at, look at the profile. So it, it, everything can have two meanings, he says, depending on how you look. And indeed, if you look at this work, which is the print, I mean, the drawing made of uh, ventriloquist, you can see more clearly the whale. But you can also see what I've been trying to suggest all along. Because the bulk of the work, right, assumes the form of the letter I. He's telling us that this is him, right, in pictorial, ventriloquized terms. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, hear any complaints, whatever you got. Yeah. Yes. I, I have. It was a complicated thing to speak with Jasper Johns. Um, I made an appointment. I went over to his apartment. Uh, he lived in one of the grand mansions uh, on the Upper East Side. And, uh, you know, I, I immediately get a sense of uh, grandeur because there are paintings by Cezanne and a number of other artists, including Reichenberg, all around me. The uh, butler tells me to wait. Johns comes in about an hour later, um, and he sits 
opposite me, such that we're not in a direct line of sight, and he sits next to, uh, on a couch next to one of Warhol's Brillo boxes, which he then puts his drink on. It was the most potent sign of artistic mastery I'd ever seen. And, um, and I knew that he was uncomfortable with questions about sexuality, so I thought I'd, I'd sort of go to them very gently. The minute I asked him a question of that kind of import, he would look at me unblinkingly and stare and say nothing. And because he was very slow to speak in the first place, I was always like, is he thinking or is he freaking me out? <laughs> and um, eventually I came to realize that he was freaking me out. And so I, after about three or four false attempts, ended the interview by saying, thank you, Mr. Johns, I appreciate your time, and wanted to get the hell out of there. And then he invites me, immediately warm and friendly, to come into the kitchen and have tea. Would you like some tea? So, Jonathan, where do you go out when you come to New York? A kind of gay coded question, right? Um, and he was immediately friendly, and I thought, okay, this is going well again. Um, so I'm going to ask him another question. And immediately I do. He stares at me for a full two and a half minutes without saying a word. So again, I say I'm going to go, and as soon as I say I go, he asks me another friendly question. And what I came to realize is he's yo yoing me. He's letting me know that I can right? I am utterly subject to him and I will have to do whatever he suggests. And so I left after about an hour and a half, went to a park bench and cried my eyes out because I'd met my idol and he wasn't a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. If I get a bit of a rhetorical, so I hope you'll bear with me. Of course. I was just saying to your co yesterday, I'm a musician, and I have a hard time connecting like my own study of music to like visual art and like that kind of thing. And I feel like completely proven wrong by your entire talk here because there's something very musical about just like incorporating all these like coded messages the way that like an art, like a musical artist does. So for an album, I'm thinking of like Frank Ocean's Blonde. Absolutely. Um, and I'm wondering if you engage with music in any way as part of your study here. It's, it's um, it, I do engage with music because one of the fundamental figures in this entire sort of circle, perhaps the most influential thinker is John Cage. Um, yeah. Um, and not just 433. Um, John Cage's own writings, his statements, John Cage's ability to take the idea that a work of art is not an expression of the artist, but right, a product of the viewer's or the audience's cognition. Uh-huh. Anything else? Yeah. Have they done, um, sorry, I can project. Um, I'm sorry to ask, this isn't really about the sexuality, but the, jo the John's painting um, where the canvas is hidden, have they done any studies of that to see if there was a portrait on the other side? Yeah, so um, that one has never been x-rayed and I am dying to know what's underneath. I don't know. Anything else? Well, thank you. Enjoy your day.